have been known as APVA, which is Association for the Preservation of Virginia Antiquities, the Northampton Branch. We've also been known as the Northampton Branch PVA, Preservation Virginia. And today, we are Northampton Historic Preservation Society, same group of people doing the same work. Our mission remains the same, to ensure that preservation in Northampton County and Virginia historical properties through interpretation, education, advocacy programs, and restoration. And with your help, we're going to make that happen. Now that we're no longer a part of the state organization but our own 501c3, I have the distinct honor of serving as the first president, I'm a little bragging here, the first president of the Northampton Historic Preservation Society, or NHPS. Now for years everybody said APDA, APDA. I want everybody to say NHPS. <laughs> NHPS, <laughs> NHPS, that's us. So, um, I also have the honor of serving with an incredible board. Some of our board members have been on the board for over 50 years. And I'm not going to call you out, but I'm going to ask you to stand up. All the board members, please stand and be recognized. <laughs> Today is our first NHPS program, and uh, so many folks have given their time and talents to make this possible. But I'd like to especially thank uh, Katie Hubbard. Where are you, Katie? Katie? <laughs> and Katie Hubbard. Hey, Katie. Katie's our program director and has, has lots on her plate. Thank you so much, Katie. Air Baldwin's not here, but Chris Ashby is. Chris Ashby's in the back with the gold shirt. They were so wonderful to lend us this tent and uh, cut some of the grass and uh, do about 100 other honeydews that I'm always asking them to do. I'd also like to thank Dr. Garrison Brown. Where are you, Garrison? Garrison. He's the pumpkin man. <laughs> Garrison does many things for our organization. Of course, he's on our board. And he provided um, a lot of hard work in the building and outside the building and uh, we have a wonderful um, millstone that the Barrier Islands were kind enough to lend us so that we would be easily um, easy accessible to get in into the cottage and Garrison from his hard work made that happen as well and apple seed nursery with all the moms and pumpkins we thank them and we certainly want to thank for along Baldwin for his generous contribution for the National Historic uh, landmark bronze plaque that's placed in front of the cottage that you can all see after the program. And one day I'm not going to be able to read, so I'm going to have to memorize something. So I'm reading today. Um, now I'd like to tell you about our guest speaker this afternoon, Lewis Mann. Lewis has been with Preservation Virginia since 1982, and he's held various positions in his 31 years with the association. In his current role as Director of Preservation Services, he manages the preservation and museum property operations uh, for, for Preservation Virginia. He also advises other organizations, such as ours, <laughs> and individuals in preservation with their sites. Lewis received his BA in Philosophy and Religious Studies from Virginia Commonwealth University in 1977, and Lewis, you don't look that <laughs> And has done additional work towards his master's degree in architectural history from VCU. He has published and presented papers at several professional gatherings from Mobile, Alabama, Portland, Maine, and many other locations in between. Lewis and his wife, Lucia, live in a historic house in Blackstone, Virginia, and are the proud parents of five grown children scattered from Richmond to Los Angeles. His son is a captain in the U.S. Army and is now currently serving in South Korea. Thank you for us. It's only fitting that Lewis is here today as our guest speaker because Lewis was instrumental in the process leading to Pear Valley becoming on the National Historic Register or Landmark. So with that, thank you, Lewis. This is Lewis Malin.
thank you very much. Can y'all hear me without the? Can y'all hear me without the mic? <laughs> Yeah. Will that mess up your recording if I don't use it? It's nice to have the microphone. Okay. Yeah. Nice have, all right, we'll use that anyway. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. I think this is a really a, a, a milestone event. Not only are you one of the newest uh, preservation organizations in the Commonwealth of Virginia, this is one of America's newest National Historic Landmarks. Uh, it was almost exactly a year ago, it was the day after Election Day last year, when I went up to D.C. for the hearing of the panel that evaluates uh, properties to be recommended to the Secretary of Interior to be designated as National Historic Landmarks. And there were, I guess, 18, 20 properties on the uh, agenda for that. It was actually a two-day meeting. We were fairly confident we were going to be on the first day, so I just had tickets up and back on, on the train. Fortunately, we were like number six or seven on the agenda, so I got a chance to hear some of the other uh, competition, if you will, uh, for designation. And it was wonderful to hear about Chautauquas and distilleries and, and uh, baseball stadiums and, and all kind of really interesting presentations. But when the time came for Pear Valley, the panel, uh, who are mostly retired folks working with the Park Service, and architectural historians, academics, they all knew about Pear Valley, and there was little uh, hesitancy on their part. In fact, the only question, Virginia Price, who wrote the, the nomination, she used to work for us back in the day, uh, and now works for the uh, National Park Service, she had written a, a beautiful nomination that really will be a guide for you as you go forward uh, with this property. But she made her presentation, and the only question uh, was from Bill Murtaugh, who had retired from the Park Service as keeper of the register after 20 some odd years. And he actually questioned whether or not uh, the, he, he thought the house looked too good. <laughs> so keep that in mind. He didn't think that much original fabric uh, could look that good after that long. Uh, but that didn't keep him from voting for it. It was a unanimous recommendation to the secretary. And it was designated in March of this year with 12 others, a uh, group of 13 that are the newest National Historic Landmarks, which is the highest designation the Park Service, uh, Department of Interior, grants to historic properties. There are less than 3,000 nationwide and in all the territories. And I know that I know Air Hall is on there. There are probably a handful of others here on the shore. But it, it's remarkable to me, and I, I'm reminded every time I drive up the road and, and see how modest in scale this house is, that it has survived. Uh, and that so many people recognize its importance. So as we get ready to pass the stewardship of this property from Preservation Virginia to NHPS, it is going to take a while to get used to the, those initials. Um, what I wanted to do is just give you a few thoughts. Uh, I was thinking driving over, the, we date this house back to 1740s, so it's roughly 270 years old. We got it in 1986, so we've had it for 27 years, 10% of its lifetime, which to me seems like a long time, 27 years, but it helps you appreciate uh, how many people have been involved in this house still being here. Uh, many, many, many others like it have gone away. In fact, people will always ask, you know, why, why is Pear Valley so important? And I would go on about glass purlins and false plates and, and things like that that uh, you know, architectural historians get excited about. But <clears throat> after a while, I just started saying, what really makes it important is not that it was unique in its time, but that it's unique in our time. Because this survives intact with a lot of the building features that mark the transition, the evolution, if you will, of the traditional Virginia house from had been referred to as earth fast, where you simply put poles in the ground and build on top of those. And that was the common form for all levels of society for the first uh, 100 years. We found evidence of many, many, many of those at uh, historic Jamestown. But even as the economy and the nation spread out, tobacco, which was the main crop, was so labor intensive and so depleting of the soil that people tended not to stay in the same place for very long. So they didn't invest a whole lot in their property. They would put 
put up a, a shelter that would keep them, you know, safe from the elements. But it wasn't really until the, the, the 18th century, the beginning of the, the next century, when they had been here for long enough to feel secure, when the uh, agricultural economy had matured and diversified, that they really began to invest in their houses. And properties of this scale were much more common than the large plantation houses, many of which survive, although not nearly as intact as, as, as this is. This was very typical of, of what uh, was built. But because it was small, because it was utilitarian, a lot of them tended to be turned into other uses. They tended to be neglected, abandoned. They would burn uh, for whatever reason. Uh, they just don't exist anymore. So that's what, that is part of what makes Pear Valley so important to us uh, and to you, I hope, as you take over the stewardship of this property, is that it is a testament to that evolution of the Virginia house uh, and very emblematic of uh, what was typical of uh, plantation, plantation economy with the small p, typical of its time. So what I'd like to do this morning, or this afternoon, is tell you a little bit about the last 27 years, because that's the time I know uh, better than the history before that. Tell you some of the decisions that, uh, the thinking that went into the decisions we made, and if I may, offer a few suggestions for you as you take on the stewardship of this property and become the next stage of its history. So I have written a lot of this out, so if you don't mind, I'm going to do some reading too, because I want to make sure that that this record does stay intact. All right, up to the first page. Uh, as Dan mentioned, I've been with Preservation Virginia for 31 years. So I was with the organization in late 1986 when Mr. Oliver uh, made the donation of this house and just a hair over one acre of land that surrounds it to us and passed it to our stewardship. But that was not our first involvement with Pear Valley. Uh, when I first saw it, or, and <coughs> when we took control of it, there was a tin roof on the building. And in the early 70s, uh, with the help of Floyd Knock and our executive director at the time, Angus Murdoch, they convinced the owner to uh, place, the, rather than just let the house continue to go to rack and ruin, just to put a fairly inexpensive tin roof on the building. Now, it was not authentic, it was not, there was no question that, you know, it, was, it wasn't a restoration, it was simply a protective measure. But what that did was by keeping the uh, elements out, which is all we ask a roof to do, keep the rain away, it preserved the building to the point where uh, a decade or so later, Mr. Oliver made the gift of the house to us. Now, when it came to us, <coughs> it had been used as a storage barn. I would say a lot of the buildings of this size you know, went into other uses. Um, it has been storage for hay and for chickens and other animals. Now, in order to make it function as that, the owners had actually poured a cement floor inside of Pear Valley. To do that, they had to remove the joist that went from sill to sill along the ground level. Um, and then, in order to make that door where, where Nan put the uh, uh, millstone, that door was cut down to ground level so the animals could come in and out. What that did was cut one of the remaining sills in half. So over time, and we don't know exactly when all that was done, but probably in the early part of the 20th century, the building was actually coming apart. Uh, the, the weight of the building and the roof, even though it's modest in scale, it was not meant to support the foundation itself was not meant to support uh, the building without all of its structural elements. So the foundation, the, the sills, were twisting out. And there was actually a gap uh, in the corner to the right there that you could see where the both sills had separated. So we immediately embarked on a two-track preservation approach that was based on the guiding principle that we would do nothing more than required to stabilize the structure and to respect every bit of historic, original historic fabric that we could identify. Where new materials had to be introduced, they were to be compatible with 
and subservient to the original fabric and would be easily distinguishable from that original fabric. Now, in plain language, that simply means that all new materials would only be there to allow the original materials to function as they were originally intended. Although the sills were twisted out, And they were, they were twisting out from the loss of horizontal support provided by the joists that had been removed. We would draw them back in by reintroducing those structural members and not simply replacing the entire assemblage. The, the cement floor itself had been removed in the, earlier in the 80s uh, during an archaeological investigation. Uh, and if any of you are familiar with archaeologists, they're... <laughs> They're wonderful at digging, not so much at cement removal. So they went in there with jackhammers and pickaxes uh, to get it out of the way so they could get down to, to see what was underneath. Now the good thing was the, uh, the cement had sealed in place any remains that were underneath it. So they were able to find some interesting dating uh, information in there. But actually what they did by digging there had actually helped to undermine the foundations as well. You know, this was one of those unintended consequences from, from good action. But um, so the, the, the building was actually in distress. The, the, the building was twisting out. The foundation was being undermined. So we decided that the first thing we would do would be to get a good historic structures report on the building. Now, this is one of the most studied buildings in Virginia. <laughs> but most of the uh, architectural historians come in and, and place it in the context of the evolution of building type. They don't necessarily uh, study that much on what needs to be done to it. And that was the intent of our historic structures report, and I'm pretty sure you have a copy of that now. That was completed in the early 90s, and it became, for the next 20 years, my guide uh, to the preservation of this property. We were fortunate to work with Jody Lahendro, uh, who had done many, many projects for uh, Preservation Virginia. And for the last 10 years, he's been the uh, lead architectural historian at the University of Virginia, uh, working on the preservation of the rotunda and the original uh, buildings out front and along the pavilion row. <coughs> so while that was going on, even before that was completed, uh, we began the careful process of stabilizing the foundation. Now, wherever possible, you remember I said, we, we tried to, our guiding principle was to preserve original fabric. So wherever possible, we use consolidants, uh, a kind of a material, and Chris, you're probably familiar with these, that actually use the shell of the original structure and where it rotted on the inside, it, re, it reforms that original uh, mem structural member. Where they could, they use those. Where those were not possible, where they had to be replaced, for instance, where the, the sill had been cut away from the door, we did bring in new materials. But all new material that was brought in here is date stamped. Somewhere on that uh, piece of wood is a stamp with 1998 or 2003 or 2005. Anytime new material is put in, it is identified. So the future people, on, after what we have done has been forgotten, if someone were to go in there, 50 years from now and want to analyze this building, they will have definite clues as to when uh, new material was introduced. <clears throat> now we got a mason to, to dig out and replace the foundation. They would actually do sections at a time because we were afraid to try to jack the house up just because of the lack of, we weren't convinced that its stability would take that. So section by section and alternating pattern, they rebuilt the foundation in place using the bricks that they could uh, salvage or reuse in there. Again, when we had to bring in new material, those are mostly below grade, uh, so they're not visible. Um, now, we were fortunate, but the first things we had to do, once the foundation was secure and the, the sills had been rebuilt, we joined them back together. The joists, the original joists were long since gone, but the sills, you could still see where the joists were, how they were joined in, and what the sequencing was, and pretty much what the dimensions of those would have been from the stainings that were on the, the original sill. 
So we had salvaged some good hard pine from a building in Sussex County, and we cut those to size and, and put those in here as the, as the cross joints. Not new material, it's old material, but it's new to Pear Valley. So those two are date stamped and identified uh, for future people to understand uh, what was put in. Now probably the first thing you notice when you walk in, uh, stepping on the nice new millstone, you step onto plywood. Now obviously this is not a historic material. <laughs> but since we did not know what the floor uh, had been made of, and we did not know how it had been laid, we decided that to make the house function, we would put in plywood as a temporary measure so you could walk in, look at the house, get an idea of what's going on, um, but we weren't making any assumptions or guesses at that point about what that floor should be or would have been. <coughs> so all of that process took a couple of years. Uh, you know, it, it's easy to summarize in a couple of paragraphs, but that was a long, painstaking process to go through. But with that stable, the next thing we uh, undertook was the, the chimney. And the chimney, fortunately, uh, had played a big role probably in keeping that house together. Uh, as I said, as the sills twisted out and the foundation was undermined, that chimney stood. Uh, it's one entire gable end. And that, and just the synergy that old buildings developed, and frankly, some, some good luck. Uh, kept this building in place. We brought in a group from Fredericksburg called Tidewater Preservation. You probably, Fred Ecker and his group, uh, some of y'all may know him. Really excellent, excellent craftsmen that, that took their time to repoint the entire <coughs> chimney stack and preserve those, the glazed headers that are such a, a signature part of, of that view of Pear Valley. And you can see at the very top, there's a, a cap on the chimney that keeps the rain out and birds out and, and other uh, bad things from happening inside. Uh, nicely done, you, you can, if you look for it, you can see it, but it, it was done in a way that's very low profile. There, there's some slight pieces up there. It's a, there's a slight opening left with some ventilation. And speaking of ventilation, you'll also notice on the side there are some windows, two small windows that, that uh, ventilate the attic. Those are new windows, new glass. Uh, they were already new when we out the property. So what we did was put little ventilators in there as a way to keep an airflow through the building. Uh, to, again, to as a passive way to uh, enhance its preservation. Now that 1970s tin roof that I talked about before uh, had done its job, but it was coming to the end of its useful life. Uh, tin is a great material, but you know, can only ask so much of it. <laughs> and obviously it was not authentic. Now, early investigations of the property had uncovered some oak shingles in the attic spaces, rounded by oak shingles. So that was what uh, Jody recommended and what we decided to replace. Um, this is, you know, this was 2003, 2004, kind of the, the beginning of the real explosion of the internet. Maybe I got a little carried away, but I started working with a broker out of uh, Vancouver because we wanted really good quality oak, and it was hard to find uh, here locally. So I got in touch with him, and he actually, these oak shingles that are on there now are from old growth oak that were harvested in Germany and shipped over here through the port of Savannah. So we only got 10 squares. It was a, you know, one truck brought them all the way here uh, from Savannah, but it was a real effort to make sure that we got the best quality material uh, where we had to bring in new material. We wanted it to, to be really good. Now they promised me those would last 35 years. So it's up to you to make sure that they actually do. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that was written, but they certainly assured me that, that they would get 35 years worth of it. Um, the last thing I want to talk about in, in this section is the fireplace. Because when you go on the inside, and we left part of the ground in front of that fireplace uh, undisturbed because there was a root cellar there and we wanted to probably at some point do some additional archaeology to, to make a, a study of that. <laughs> but how to restore that fireplace was probably the decision that I fretted over more than any other. Uh, it was in horrible shape. Uh, as I said, the chimney until we put the cap on there had been open. Rain was coming in. It's a massive, massive <coughs> chimney. Uh, I could stand up inside of it. 
but the, the, the bricks were uh, in, in horrible shape. And again, it was just uh, cussedness, I guess you might say, that they kept it together. Uh, it really should have fallen down some time ago. But uh, houses that survive for 270 years have to adapt. And that fireplace is a wonderful example of adaptation of the people that lived within the house through the centuries that it was a functioning home. Uh, it started out as a huge open cooking fireplace. And you'll see in there there's a, a lintel that goes from end to end. It's massive. That was the extent of the original firebox. And that's how much was uh, originally available to them for cooking. <coughs> And that served well for the first couple of uh, historians will break the house into five different periods of occupation uh, based on uh, different renovations. The first two periods always had that large fireplace opening. At some point in the middle part of the 19th century, maybe even earlier than that, we're not exactly sure, it was no longer needed to work as a cooking fireplace, so it was greatly reduced in size. The firebox was filled in partially. It was still a heating fireplace, but it was no longer needed to be as big as it was and burn as much fuel as it must have to do the function it was then being asked to do. So the bricks were in very poor shape, and frankly, once the exterior stabilization took precedence, it was the late 90s before we began to consider how to preserve this fireplace and how much of the two iterations to preserve. Now, and you'll find out as you take on property stewardship, you make hundreds of decisions in how you do preservation. Uh, the structures we deal with are by definition centuries old and have passed through many, many stages in their life. Our charge as preservationists and as stewards is to select which of those uh, stages is the one to which we should restore and interpret. And it's not always the original that is the most significant or is even accessible uh, any longer. And frankly, it is the adaptability or adaptability of a property that helps to make it interesting. Uh, a house that never had a change would be awfully uh, unusual. Probably in the houses you live in, you probably made changes over the years to, to adapt to, to differing needs. So that becomes part of the story of the house. So since that fireplace, and, and you see when you step in, is such a dominant feature, as soon as you walk in that door, how we approached its stabilization uh, was something that was problematic, I guess. <laughs> but in the case of Vera, Vera Valley, most of its uniqueness, most of its comment uh, in architectural histories is not so much for its interior fireplace as it is for its exterior features. And those we felt were being well preserved. But the fireplace being such a dominant interior feature could not be minimized. So what we decided to do, and this is after endless discussions and examinations of what was possible and practical, we settled for what you'll see when you walk inside. And it's a little bit, it's half and half. <laughs> um, people could disagree, but it's what we chose to do. If you stand on one side, if you go to the far wall and look toward the chimney or toward the fireplace, what you will see is the original opening. It fully extended to the side, and all the way to the end of the lintel. You'll see a couple of the baking niches on the inside. And you can understand the scope and scale of that feature and how it was dominant to the lives of the people that lived there for the time that it was the cooking fireplace. If you stand on the other side, you stand on the near side and look toward it, your eye will be drawn to the smaller one. And the stabilized bricks there are held by a piece of iron, obviously not original, but, but a stabilization technique that will show you how the building adapted, how the building was adapted by the families who were using it for the needs that they saw. Decisions that are made, they can easily be undone. And part of our decision process was that anything we do would be reversible. Now, it is stable. It is held together with mortar, so it's not easily reversible. But it is reversible if you...